Lord, have mercy. I don't need to say a word. No. Um, yeah, have, you know, when I was told last spring, and you all beat us, so what? <laughs> and I was glad that they'd come because it would have been really uncomfortable to come after that um, flipping you all gave us last spring. I was told last spring that. Um, Do I have a mic? When better? Okay. That um, the incredible Nikki Finney had agreed to introduce me last spring. Volunteered. Volunteered. That's true. <laughs> And when the lecture was canceled and rescheduled for the fall, the first date they gave me, Nikki was going to be in Cuba, and I said, I'm not coming. <laughs> I'm not coming until Nikki is back. And um, now I'm about to cry. Um, this, this amazing woman, uh, Nikki Finney um, is someone that I, I know when I'm writing something that doesn't make sense, I can email her. And she will email me back, or she will email me and say, look, oh, oh, yes, um, sorry, but this is the South, and I can do this. <laughs> I was born here. Um, so, and we have a love of pencils. Now, Nikki has a particular brand that I couldn't find, but. Aww. That's a good kind, yeah. And, before I go on with my formal remarks, I turned around when Nikki was introducing me, and, and thank you all, I mean, so many friends who are here and former colleagues, but I turned around, and there in the second row was family. Please stand. <laughs> these, these are the glimpses, and Doris Glimp Green, um, when I went to graduate school, my professor said, who taught you how to write? And I said, my English teacher, and that was my cousin. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, um, the President and the Dean, for being here and for your lovely welcome. Nikki, you have lifted my spirits on so many occasions. And this is what I wrote, um, what a treasure the state and nation has, that you are here. Sometimes it's just enough to go back and read her poems, read her emails, which are like a precious archive for me. It's enough to keep me going, to be assured that I can keep writing Thank you for your poetry that keeps us from forgetting a long and painful history, but also keeps us from forgetting the joys as well. I want to thank the African American Studies Program of the College of Arts and Sciences for inviting me to give this distinguished lecture. Val, Dr. Littlefield, in particular, whose friendship across the decades I treasure and whose exemplary and passionate leadership of this program has put it on the map. Thank you. I am honored to be here to give this lecture, which since its inception has brought outstanding scholars to this campus to honor Robert Smalls and his legacy, 
It's incredibly humbling to know that I follow in the footsteps of so many who have come before me, stood here, including Nikki. I'm also honored to be invited to speak at a place where so many of my colleagues in the Department of History, and um, I remember the days when we were next door to each other, um, have done and continue to do incredible work on the history of the South, memory and reconstruction. So I want to talk tonight briefly about what I call Reconstruction's open sore, the promises and perils of how we write and remember history. Nikki, you may remember this one. I sent it to her. I was in Albany, New York, working in the archives, state archives, and I found this, and I sent it to her. And um, On January the 4th, 1864, Alfred Harrison joined the Union Army. He was one of some 180,000 black men who enlisted. Alfred Harrison joined and enlisted in Brooklyn and was mustered in at Rikers Island in Company G, 26 U.S. Colored Infantry. He was a young man, 24, a husband and a father, and he was born here, as you can see. When he filled out his form, he said he listed his place of birth as Columbia, South Carolina, you can imagine how excited I was. I had never seen the papers of a black man from Columbia who joined the Union Army. Somehow, Alfred Harrison made his way from Columbia to um, New York, along with his wife, and his child who was born in 1857, and he became a farmer. And this is the unit that he joined, the 26th U.S. Colored Troop. And that's another image of them. I'm trying to, still trying to figure out if he's among this group, and I'm not sure. The U.S., the 26 U.S. Colored Troop was mustered in New York and spent the last year of the war here in Beaufort. Imagine that. Alfred Harrison left a world where slavery reigned. He returned to this state, to his home state, to defeat that world. The world in which he was born he spent the last year of the war in Beaufort in the same town where Robert Smalls was born, and maybe they knew each other. They were born within a couple of years of each other. They were, in many ways, no different from this man. This is Samuel Smith, a black man from Kentucky, also with a family who enlisted in the Union Army a father and a husband. And here he's pictured with two of his children. His wife at the time is pregnant, Molly. Her name was Molly Stiegel. These were men who, along with their wives and children, lived through the Civil War. They fought for freedom. <clears throat> they fought for a nation they hoped would remember them as unionists and see their humanity. They fought for a nation they hoped would see that victory for the Union was the best opportunity this country had had since it was formed to live up to its creed. These were men and women who, when news of the coming war arrived, began picking up their feet and leaving. 
From the first months of the war, slaveholders found themselves spending a great deal of time and resources tracking down their property and punishing any they found. In November of 1861, 16-year-old Emma Sams, a white woman from South Carolina, wrote to find out if a group of black women and children who had left their plantation had been, quote, hung yet. The flight of slaves from the plantation household called particular consternation due less to their value from a cost perspective than to black women's centrality to the plantation household. The Civil War would give black people new ground to fight for freedom. Slavery had allowed black people cramped space, cramped room to breathe, and in that narrow space, they created a nurtured family and community and an anti-slavery politics that prepared them to move when war came. The young slave girl was tried and sold, tried in a court of law in which black people had no right to a jury and sold for burning down the home of her mistress. The mother, the black mother, who had, quote, four babies killed within her by whipping, end quote. One of the children had his eye cut out. Another, its leg broken. These black children, these black girls and young women had no choice but to develop an anti-slavery politics. So, to Susanna. Susanna, a black woman who stood her ground when her master threatened to shoot her pigs. She reminded him that it, was, that it was only because she had pigs that she had salt and winter meat and shoes for her children. With every act of resistance and even obedience, Enslaved people stamped their humanity on an inhumane system. Whether they were running away, working extra hours to supplement the rations their masters gave them, nurturing their children, teaching their children about who slaveholders were, about their character, whether they were fighting for their homes and families, even when they knew they could be casually torn apart, whether they were pleading from the auction block to keep their families intact, whether they were turning an old piece of cloth into an elaborate turban. Enslaved people turned the policed and cramped quarters of the slave community into spaces of love and resistance and life. Sometimes this meant having to make the most repulsive of bargains. The memory of past struggle and the sometimes damnable bargains black people were forced to make took concrete shape in their wartime rebellion. This memory sat with Chloe down in the low country of South Carolina as she played her mistress's piano her master found her playing away like the very devil. This memory of past struggles moved through the bodies of the two black women while Chloe played, they were upstairs dancing away. It moved through the bodies of the children in the hallway. It was this scene of a black woman playing a piano that didn't belong to her and two black women upstairs dancing away that confronted Henry Ravenel when he returned secretly, hoping to secretly steal some of his slaves away. He was clearly riveted by this performance, which must, must have triggered memories for him as well. Perhaps Chloe, playing the piano, did really have the devil in her and the dancing damsels as well. We can imagine them, Chloe, and the dancing dam damsels as having been silent observers on the occasions when that piano had entertained slaveholders, 
We may be sure that they understood how the planter's ownership of their bodies and labor made possible the ownership of the piano. The performance their master came up on, like others of its kind, was its own fire bill in the night. The new nation that would emerge in 1865 was a nation founded in blood, like the old nation that it replaced. But this new nation was supposed to be different. It was a nation where there would be no slavery and where black people would have the right to their children the right to walk the streets, the right to wear whatever they wanted to wear, to go to school. Black people did not expect that they would have to fight another civil war. The civil war, another civil war did come. And, you know, I always turn back to W.E.B. Du Bois because we have to, I have to. And we talk about Reconstruction, but Du Bois said it was really a civil war. He said a civil war in the South overthrew Reconstruction. And he said we must not forget that fact. This new civil war, Du Bois wrote, was, quote, a determined effort to reduce black labor as nearly as possible to a condition of unlimited exploitation. The South lost the Civil War of 1861 to 1865, but they won the next one. The magnitude of the Redeemer counter-revolution, as Eric Foner writes, underscored both the scope of the transformation Re Reconstruction had tried and the consequences of its failure. Now, some of the accomplishments of Reconstruction remained, and the Southern landscape was altered in fundamental ways. But it wasn't altered enough. Today, more than 150 years since the war ended, we've come to another profound moment in our history. This moment will also leave an altered landscape, literally and figurative, uh, figuratively. Since the massacre at Emanuel Church in Charleston, a movement has arisen that is determined to change the physical landscape of the South by removing or destroying monuments erected decades after the war, to honor the memory of men and women who fought to erect a pro-slavery nation state. On the other side stand those who see the removal of the Confederate battle flag and the statues of Robert E. Lee, Thomas Jackson, and many other Confederate leaders as an assault on their heritage. And I'll say more about that later. Monuments have been taken down in the dead of the night and some toppled in the glare of daylight. This week, the leadership of the National Cathedral in Washington made the decision to remove stained glass windows honoring Lee and Jackson. The cathedral had been wrestling with this <clears throat> for quite a while, at least two to three years. But it's sad that after the massacre in Charleston and after Charlottesville, it could not wait anymore. Those things proved to be too much for the church. <clears throat> the bodies of lynched black people did not prove to be too much. I could not have known when I first accepted the invitation to give this lecture that the questions that got at my thinking then would, within the year, become so much a part of our national discourse and debates about who we are as a people, as citizens of this country, and what kind of country we are trying to become. What has not changed, indeed, has, has become more urgent is the need to understand how slavery and Reconstruction and their legacies have led us to today and shaped the journey to this place. Why Reconstruction remains an open sore, a wound that seems impossible to heal. How we write and remember history tells us why this is so important. 
For so long, the dominant narrative about slavery, about the Civil War, about Reconstruction made it possible or made it impossible for this nation to really move forward. That narrative contended, as one writer stated, that Reconstruction represented an attempt to establish with the bayonet African barbarism on the ruins of Southern society, that it was a conspiracy against human progress. In the aftermath of the Civil War, comments like this did not address what Du Bois called the Civil War in the South. On September the 22nd, to take us back to an important point, December, uh, September 22nd, 1862, Abraham Lincoln made one of the most important announcements of his tenure as president. And I'm going to quote him here. And it's a a passage that many of you, especially the historians among you, are familiar with. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, he announced and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, do hereby proclaim and declare that hereafter, as heretofore, the war will be prosecuted for the object of practically restoring the constitutional relation between the U.S. That remained his objective constitutionally restoring, restoring the constitutional relation between the North and South. That it is my purpose, he continued, to recommend the adoption of a practical measure to aid the free acceptance or rejection of all the slave states. That proposal, he went on to say, was to ask that these states, slave states, voluntarily adopt the immediate or gradual ab abolishment of slavery and be reassured that their efforts would be not only compensated financially, but that they need not worry that black people would remain among them. Lincoln, on September 22nd, 1862, again called for the removal of black people, for their colonization somewhere else. This is how the president began the preliminary emancipation proclamation with an offer of compensated emancipation to slaveholders in rebellion against the United States. He reminded him that his principal object was not emancipation but union. He reminded them that the objective of the U.S. was not changed, had not changed, and that his commitment was still first and foremost union. He sought to encourage them by telling them they would be paid, they would be compensated for their slaves. And he gave them 100 days to make a decision. Take the money, or as he would say, you will lose. None of them took him up on this offer. And so, as promised on January the 1st, 1863, Lincoln declared that all persons held as slaves within designated states and parts of states were now free. The preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and the 1863 Proclamation do reveal, or did reveal, just how far the nation had come since 1861. How far did it come since on the morning of April 12th, 1861, at 3 o'clock, or really 3.30 a.m., the aides de camp, George, uh, James C. Chestnut and Stephen D. Lee of the Confederate South, sent a message to the Union commander at Fort Sumter telling him to vacate or they would fire on uh, the, the fort. By the time that Lincoln, between that firing on Fort Sumter in April of 1861 and Lincoln's decision to act in 1863. By that time, hundreds of thousands of black people had quit slavery. They had taken their freedom. Lincoln followed them. But neither the United States nor the Confederacy had anticipated this development. 
And after the war and into the 20th century, white Southerners, often with the aid of white Northerners, trafficked in a romance of the plantation as a site of happy slaves and slaveholders. They trafficked in a history that was fake news. Sorry. <laughs> Columbia University in the city of New York trained scholars like um, Scott, well, I won't give you long names, too, too many. Trained scholars who told stories, not history. They told stories of happy slaves. They told stories of slaveholders who were dedicated to their slaves. They told stories about Reconstruction as an evil unparalleled in history. It was not slavery, they wrote, that was the evil, but the emancipation of the enslaved. The resistance of black people to slavery and, and the plantation before, during, and after the war spoke to a different narrative. We are now past the conclusion of the 150th anniversary of the war, which proved, thank goodness, remarkably different from the 100th anniversary. From 2011 to 2015, historians and other scholars reminded Americans over and over again that the South went to war to preserve slavery. It still hasn't taken. <laughs> The 150th anniversary of the start of the nation's transition to a country without slaves, to a country in which black workers like white workers were entitled to freedom and a wage, has been and will be much less commemorated. Unlike the Civil War commemorations, there have been far fewer conferences. I know there was one here, I think, last year. One's going to be in Charleston in the spring. Hundreds of new books on the Civil War came out between 2010 and 2015. There will be new books on Reconstruction, but nothing near or comparable to the tide we've just witnessed. Understanding why Reconstruction isn't open sore in the present requires that we not forget the circumstances of its rebirth in 1865. Freedom came to this country, Du Bois wrote, in 1935, in blood and servile war. But this is not obvious in the way we talk and write about slavery. We write about slavery's gradual disintegration, that it deteriorated. And it's true that slavery was not destroyed at one fell stroke, but terms like disintegration don't capture the rupture. President Lincoln endorsed this kind of thinking in 1862 when he implored the border states to adopt a program of gradual emancipation. He told them if they did not, if they hesitated, they would lose more and more, and the loss would be massive. He said, all will be gone, you will lose it all. He told them, because or due to friction, friction and abrasion. These are the president's words, friction and abrasion. The incidents of war, Lincoln wrote, cannot be awarded, uh, avoided if the war continue long as it must. And the object will be that in the institution of slavery will be extinguished by mere friction and abrasion. They would lose, the president argued, but what Lincoln called friction and abrasion, Du Bois called a servile war. Historian Stephen Hahn has called the greatest slave rebellion in modern history. Lincoln tried appealing to the pockets of slaveholders, offering the coffers of the federal government as a solution to the unfolding survival war. He offered, in effect, to enact, enact 
a massive slave market transaction in which the U.S. government would become the purchaser. It was a remarkable thing. It was not the president's best moment. Lincoln would soon turn a deaf ear to those who were saying, you know, send them away, um, make a deal where, you know, the government buys them. Because he realized that that friction and abrasion was really feet, black people leaving. He realized that the South was on the verge of seeing 12% of its labor force walk away or run away like Robert Smalls, sail away. Lincoln knew that enslaved people were way ahead of him. They understood that his plan for their salvation, or for the salvation of the Union, did not include their salvation. They understood that Lincoln was serious when he said he would be happy if the nation came back together with or without slavery. For abolitionists who worried that the nation had already sent away its days of grace, the proclamation of 1862 and 1863 had come, one of them wrote, like a, a loud wind, a strong wind blowing from the mountain. But a more careful analysis might have led them to a different conclusion. Lincoln promised that black freedom would be recognized by the executive government, including the military and naval authority. But, the, but though the Emancipation Proclamation took the revolutionary step of providing for the arming of black men as soldiers, Lincoln refused to take the critical next step which was to offer a path to freedom. He offered instead negative affirmation. The federal government and its agents, Lincoln said, would, would do nothing to repress black people. But he encouraged them to, quote, make their own actual freedom. The point merits repeating. Lincoln placed the responsibility on the enslaved to make their freedom, leaving them where they had always been, responsible for finding their own way. For enslaved men, the Emancipation Proclamation pr provided a path to actual freedom. They could join the army. As I have written elsewhere for enslaved women, making actual freedom required that they become outlaws. Getting away from slavery made black people subject to southern slave codes. Enslaved women could make their own actual freedom only by becoming fugitives. In the process, they made themselves targets for enemy armies. As Lincoln knew, no doubt, black people would continue to act to make their own freedom, and many would die in the process. Uh, historians especially Civil War military historians get a little bent out of shape um, when we say too strongly that black people played a very important role in their own freedom. The Union Army was critical to emancipation, but it was not the only operative force. The labor of black women who risked their lives who turned abandoned plantations and woodlots into sources of profit for the U.S. Treasury Department would have differed, had reason to differ with some military scholars. It was the labor of these black women that paid for the rations they ate, that paid for the rations their children ate, that paid for the rations the elderly and the disabled received. Pro-slavery historians and, and memorialists of the lost cause proved eager to cast black women and children 
who ran away as a burden on the federal government. They were the 19th century's welfare queens. The discourse that surrounded the enterprise depicted black women and children as a burden on the US government, on the US army, on the US commissary, and the quartermasters. It ignored the fact that these women were working women. It ignored the fact that the government took part of their wages and put it in a separate fund. That fund was supposed to support orphaned black children, the elderly, the mentally ill. When the war ended, millions of dollars were sitting in that fund. But I know now where that money, at least some of it went, and it went to a good cause. Some of it. That money was used to establish the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, nobody ever told me that. But that's OK. During the war, the question, when the question arose, quote, what are we to do with the women and children? And it went up the chain of command from Mississippi and South Carolina to Washington, DC. The response from the War Department was not only not helpful, but hurtful. The adjutant general offered this opinion. He said the law pro prohibits their return, but it does not provide for their reception and support in idleness. Even the most meager rations came attached with complaints that the women and children were simply, to use modern political language, takers, a people with wild notions of what freedom meant, a people who sought to live in idleness and whose coming into union lines had produced moral chaos. Black women, union officials said, were thieves, deceitful. They carried into freedom, quote, all the vices that slavery had fostered. One wrote that these women and children especially the women, were a positive menace to Union soldiers. Small wonder, he wrote, quote, that men paused in bewilderment and panic foreseeing the demoralization and infection of the Union soldiers and the downfall of the Union cause. Union commanders largely agreed with this assessment, as did the president and the next president who followed him, President Andrew Johnson. Johnson's animus for the Freedmen's Bureau is well documented, legendary even. He was a man, a president, who wanted the Freedmen's Bureau to not help black people reunite at all. When the Freedmen's Bureau tried to use some of its money to help people get families back together, to get women and children out of camps, he said no, not realizing, I presume, that he was talking about their money. President Johnson was particularly riled by this use of the Bureau to reunite families. And historians in the early 20th century took up his cause and passed it off as the history of the South. Books like The Passing of the Great Race, published in 1916 as well, added to the historiography or from a different, sort of more, more popular perspective. Books like uh, Stoddard's the, Ri the Rising Tide of Color Against White Su World Supremacy. Black women waged war against this nonsense. They waged war against individual slaveholders and the Confederate state. But black women were not men, and they were not white. They were not soldiers, and neither were they considered non-combatants or civilians. I suspect because there were none of these things, the rights and privileges, or privileges accorded white women, non-combatants, and civilians did not accrue to them. The war they waged for freedom the war they waged to be accorded even the small rights white women claimed exist still on the margins of our history of freedom 
and the broader history of the Civil War, and even this margin is marginalized. But even here, their struggles, for even here, their struggles have been erased. The legacy of this kind of thinking has really been profound. It remains everywhere, saturating the ground on which we live. I am reminded, for example, <coughs> excuse me, of the turmoil that surrounded the installation of a mural called Justice as Protector and Avenger in 1938 at the federal courthouse in Aiken. Not that I was alive then, but <laughs> I want to say reminded, you know. This. In Aiken, <laughs> some white residents saw the construction of the courthouse itself as a federal intrusion by an alien bureaucracy. The mural, oh, I have a picture too. Okay. There it is. The mural represented justice as a barefooted woman in a loose fitting blue and white red blouse. On her right, under the label protector, the artist rendered a kind of nurturing image, rolling hills, cows, a barn, children playing. Under her left, under Avenger, he presented images of crime, murder, arson, a burning house, a prison, a shotgun. But it was the color of her skin that was the big problem. It was the color of her skin that caused the greatest consternation and galled the white citizens of Aiken in September of, of 1938 when the artist came down and installed it. The local paper objected to a, quote, mulatto woman representing justice. The sitting judge called it a monstrosity because there was a mulatto woman there. He called it a profanation. I don't, is that a word? <laughs> he used it. Well, I know. He's a judge. Okay. A profanation, Doris, is that a word? <laughs> of the courthouse and ordered it covered. The Treasury Department, which had paid $2,000 for this piece of art, promised that the artist would change it, that he would lighten this woman's skin and make her look more hopeful. Walter White of the NAACP said it was sick. We're reminded, too, of the 1926 lynching also in Aiken of the Lowman family following the killing of Aiken County Sheriff Henry Hampton Howard at the home of black tenants. In April 2003, a plaque honoring Sheriff Howard was hung at Aiken County Sheriff's Office, and he was honored by the South Carolina Law Enforcement Officers Hall of Fame. In the candlelight vigil, his name was enshrined on the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. Sheriff Howard died in the line of duty, and so these recognitions make sense in that regard. There's no problem with that. But it is the erasure of history that accompanied this honor that should concern us. This is the description on the website of the memorial group in Washington. It reads, Sheriff Howard, accompanied by three of his deputies, set out to serve a warrant for the manufacture of illegal liquor. As they approached the house, the officers were shot at, and they returned fire. Sheriff Howard was shot from the rear and died at the scene. Two of the suspects died in the altercation. Several escaped. Three were jailed. End of story. In fact, there are other facts. The murder of Sheriff Howard was not to be condoned, but that murder on the morning of April 25th, 1926, at the home of Sam and Annie Lohman, who were accused of being bootleggers, also resulted in the death of the mother, Annie Lohman, and um, and uh, Annie and Sam's uh, children, uh, Bertha, Clarence, and Demon, were wounded. Five members of the Loman family were indicted, and the youngest, Clarence, 14 years old, was charged with the shot that killed the sheriff. He was tried. The, uh, uh, 
the young uh, kid was tried on May 12th and found guilty on May 13th. <clears throat> His brother, 21 years old, was given the death sentence and their sister life imprisonment. Charges against the other Loman children were dismissed because they had run away and weren't there. In the end, well, not quite the end, along the way, the South Carolina Supreme Court ordered a new trial. But before the Loman children could be retried, a mob took all three of them out and shot them to death in the woods. The kinds of violence that took place in Aiken, both literally and symbolically, were made possible by a turn away from historical accuracy, by determination to maintain white supremacy by legal and illegal means, or by what the State Attorney General of Georgia in 1876 called by constitution or will, whatever works. Obstructionist Georgia Governor James Milton Smith prepared to instruct the white militia of his state to obey no federal orders. This is in 1876. As he called African Americans idle, thriftless, and always depending on whites for everything. Racial regimes, like those that we are familiar with in our country, writes historian Robin Kelly, are fictions. As such, they are not stable, they are fragile. And the scramble to prove black inferiority and to buttress white racial democracy in the era of Jim Crow, he writes, was no cakewalk. The previous era had unleashed, unleashed the possibility of radical change. And that struggle continued well into the 20th century when armed insurrection, political assassination, lynching, disfranchisement, imperialism, and federal complicity in the triumph of white supremacy destroyed the last sigh of black-led, biracial, democratic, populist, radical movements. In 1864, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederac Confederacy, said, quote, we seceded to rid ourselves of the rule of the majority with the enfranchisement of black men by the 15th Amendment. The fear of rule by a black majority led white Southerners to start a new civil war, which we are still fighting. The job of historians is neither to love nor hate the people we study. Our job is to study, to read with care the documents left behind, our job is to render as best we can the truths these documents contain. As Du Bois reminded us in Black Reconstruction, quote, the easiest thing to say was that the Negroes were tired of work and wanted to live at the expense of the government, wanted to travel and see things and places, but in contradiction to this was the extent of the movement and the suffering. If black people, Du Bois wrote, were seeking peace and quiet, they would have been much better off not running away. They came not because to the Union camps, not because they were lazy, but because they were striking against conditions of work. They wanted to stop the plantation economy, and to do that, they left. In the decades to come, black people continue to do that. They continue to leave the South for the North, to leave the rural areas for the urban South. They continue to save their meager funds to buy land when they could, to send their children to school, often at great cost. My mother left home to attend Harbison College as a boarding student 11 miles from Columbia, so not far from where we're sitting this evening because there was no comparable institution where she lived in rural South Carolina. And the University of South Carolina had long abandoned the progressive moment during Reconstruction when there was integration. 
At Harbison, the stated goal was to make his students wise and safe leaders for the race. It is a measure of my mother's courage that I stand here today as the Robert Smalls lecturer. Her courage is one of the facts of history. I recite this history certainly because she was my mother and I loved her. And her memory is important to me, but also more importantly for us today because her story is part of the documented history of our country. It is a part of the history of black people's long struggle for freedom in the same way that the stories of Matilda Evans, Celia Mann, Elizabeth Wright, Janie Glentgory, Majeska Simpkins, to name a few, and the history of Carver Theater, Washington Hospital, and Booker T. Washington High School are. Historians, in doing their job, have to record the dedication and the pride millions of white Southerners took in the formation of the Confederacy. In doing our job, we have to write about their belief in white supremacy. That's our job. We have to write of the pride many descendants of Confederate soldiers and politicians, the pride they, these descendants have for their ancestors who lost their lives. We have been and will continue to write about the anger some of them still feel for the loss of their investment in human property. Good historians will, however, not mistake that a war to maintain slavery was anything but that. This is a fact that is part of the history of this nation that would call forth, <clears throat> uh, has called forth cries of revenge in his novel, The Leopard Spots, that would become the basis for one of the most racist film in American history. Thomas Dixon wrote, quote, let the manhood of the Aryan race, with its 4,000 years of authentic history, rise up to answer what he and many others saw as the problems to come from the black vote, from Negroes in charge of white institutions and the general crisis that would arise in the history of the human race. Dixon called for white conquest of the globe, even. He called for the elimination of the Negro because so long as the Negro is here with a ballot in his hands, he is a menace to civilization. Reconstruction remains an open wound. The work of scholars across many disciplines is as urgently needed today as it was in 1865. Thank you. campus at Duke, we, as many of you know, um, the president just removed a statue of Robert E. Lee that was part of the portal of statues um, at the Duke Chapel. Um, and um, we're having conversations about what needs to happen next. Um, and as part of that conversation, part of that effort, um, uh, I'm working with some of my students on um, Duke's history um, with slavery. Now, Duke is one of those schools that says, well, we have history with slavery. 
we're a 20th century institution, um, so we're all good. Um, no. <laughs> so, like many 20th century institutions, um, Duke University um, has an ancestor, um, which is Trinity College. And Trinity College, um, uh, as you know, I've been researching and finding uh, a great deal there. Trinity College um, um, was connected to the Episcopal Church South. And those of you who know your history know that the Episcopal Church South was founded when the Episcopal Church split um, because the South, the Southern churches, were defending slavery. Um, and the president of Trinity College in 1860 um, had three slaves in his personal home, um, including a young woman named Melinda. Um, and so when I began working on this project uh, uh, late April um, of this year, uh, there were several like, records that said, oh, he had three slaves. And I just thought that was not good enough. Who, who, who? Um, how old were they? Were they girls, boys? Um, they have names. And so I tracked, I kept uh, frustrating the archivist by requesting like boxes and boxes and boxes. <laughs> uh, but they're good. They love to, to, to um, help you in the library. And, um, and I just kept going through boxes and boxes of stuff. And, and then one day I pulled the folder up and boom. There's Melinda, and I'm happy because Melinda um, is no longer one of his three slaves. She's a person with a name, and um, and it means that I can keep working and, and follow Melinda. But that's sort of an aside to your question. So I don't think that there's any one solution to the problem, and and I'll also say, and and this may seem quite controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, we will never get rid of everything. It's impossible. I mean, maybe it's not impossible. It's just not going to happen. I mean, because it's not just the monuments. It's the, it's the president said, it's the buildings, it's the streets, it's the schools. And I think you can do something about the monuments, you know, you know some of the in schools, you know, rename them. But it's, it, do you change? the name of Calhoun Street here. Do you change the name of Taylor Street? Taylor was a slaveholder. I mean, Columbia would, you all have a big job. <laughs> but it could be like so, so exciting because you get to rename <laughs> and, and there was a glimp plantation up in the upstate, so maybe we could get glimp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, I, in, on the serious side, I. Um, I think the conversation we're having is a really good one, um, that we're really finally, for the first time, talking about um, what it means to have a monument to Robert E. Lee uh, on your campus, um, um, on the portal to your church, um, what it means to have a statue of Calhoun you know, way, way up there in Charleston. Um, and if you've read um, the book by Mamie Garvin Fields, have any of you read that book? Um, there's this wonderful place in the book where Mamie Garvin Fields, who grew up in Charleston, says that the reason that thing is so high up in the air is because they used to uh, do damage to it. <laughs> and so it reminded me of today. But um, so I don't know. We we we, um, we can't stop talking and and trying to figure out a way. Um, to go forward that recognizes that, you know, we can't let, we can't go on and pretending that um, disinformation is history, right? Um, and with that said, um, how we manage is going to be hard, but a good, hard thing to do. Yeah. What do you think about um, 
I'm currently um, in my hometown. I proposed to, to the county council to add a monument for slaves, but in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking like they should be removed, though. And I feel like it's so overwhelming with the street, like you said, the name of the streets and everything. I feel like I have to compromise. So you say you want a monument um, to slaves erected sort of to juxtapose it to the other? Yes. And it, and I, it is still unfortunate that I feel like, like you just said, it's so much in our culture, uh, in, like, in this confederate, confederacy narrative, that I'm forced to compromise. So what are your thoughts on it? Okay, so I'm going to speak as not as as a citizen and not as a historian right now. Um, I understand the urge to want to put up monuments to counter existing monuments, but I urge us to think through it carefully, particularly putting up a monument of enslaved people in juxtaposition to a monument to Robert E. Lee. I mean, as a human being as a descendant of slaves, I, I find that kind of very disorienting and, and spiritually very bad idea. I mean, I mean, that just shouldn't be. Um, maybe find another space for the slaves. Um, but uh, I just don't see it as a solution. I, I, but I think the, 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 the work you're doing, the intellectual work you're doing to think about what to do and whether or not this is what might help. I think that's so important, right? Um, so that's just, you know, like my personal opinion. Yeah. What do, you, mm -hmm. what do you think about the idea of approaching truth and reconciliation similar to what's done in South Africa no matter what the current outcome is now? But, but uh, what if communities in this country with intentionality set out toward truth and then reconciliation? Well, I think we can't do, do it. We couldn't do what South Africa did. Because, I mean, their, their truth and reconciliation came on the heels of the end of apartheid, right? We're like 150 years down the road. Um, so many people who are here now are weren't didn't even have ancestors back. Then. I don't. I don't. I'm not. Mm, I have to think about it more, but I'm not sure that that would get us where we need to go. Because even in South Africa, you know, people weren't always honest, and it. You look at where things are now. It didn't seem to like really do much good. Um, so, yeah, I'm just not sure. But I'm willing to try anything, almost. Not quite, but. To find that light. When did you know you wanted to do what you are doing? Um, if you read my high school yearbook <laughs> thing, I think it says I want to be a French teacher. Uh, um, I'm not sure when I knew. Um, I do remember just a feeling of, of being ill at ease. I was starting to write, when I wrote Out of the House of Bondage, I had not set out to write that book. I had set out to write a different book. Um, but I couldn't write the book I set out to write because there was so much mess, you know, so much messiness um, in the, in the, in the, historiography, I couldn't find my way. Mm -hmm. And so in order to find my way, I had to write my way. Um, build the road. Build the road, yeah, um, for me to write the book I'm, I just finished. So I just finished a book on women in the war. Um, and I couldn't have written it without the other book first, right? right. So that's two very long compliments. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Wow. I'll start with the last part because I may not remember the first part. Um, I think I do what you do, what other scholars do, um, in terms of how we write. We we go. If you're a historian, you go to the archives and um, you have something in mind. You don't just go there willy nilly, and um, you look for um, documents and. 
and I, I just published a piece, well, I have a piece coming out um, uh, this fall on, on this question uh, of how I work mm -hmm. and, and why it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I'll just you know, give you a couple of uh, points, uh, things that I said in that piece is that um, I was, and I didn't say this, but this is the genesis of that piece. I was at a conference, I've been asked to be on a, a plenary session about the state of the field or something like that. And um, I had written a paper for that plenary session, but had also been working on something else that was just for me. And as I was going into the session, I decided that I didn't want to give my talk. I wanted to give my paper that was up in my room. And so I went up to my room and I got that paper. And, um, and this is the paper that's going to come out this fall. So in that paper, in that talk, what I said was that I I sit in archives in South Carolina, in Mississippi, in New York, in D.C., in Ohio, all over the country, and I, I like my fellow historians, there's Mark back there. The, um, I read these documents, but I am a 19th century scholar. I am a uh, historian of slavery um, and freedom. And so the stuff I read is just violent stuff. You can't get around it. And so I wrote about what it's like to, to sit there and read a document about a child of 12 years old having her eyes taken out, of what it's like to read about a person, I see I'm scratching the, to read about a person, you know, being branded with an iron. Um, and that is very hard. But my job is to tell that story. So it's hard emotionally, but I can't afford to let that take over my work. And so I just keep plugging away. And I have um, artists, um, oh, I talk about in my book, who help me to plug away. And I have Nikki, and I have Val, and I have you know, scholars who help me. And you know, I see you at conferences. You know, and, and those are nurturing environments. Um, so we just have to do our job. And sometimes that means you may not be happy. I may go to class really ticked off. But by the time I open my mouth, I'm, I know what I'm there for. And it's not to be ticked off. It's to, to teach. And, um, when I, and when you said about desks, I actually have four desks in my house. I actually have a project going on each one of them. And since my... Since my kids left um, to live their own lives, I've taken over their rooms. So and I have three offices <laughs> in my house. And, um, and it's such a joy. Um, so people um, like, we never see you on campus. Ooh. So this year they uh, figured out how to fix that. So they put me in a bunch of committees. So this anyway, any other questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you so very much. Thank you.